Um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about our story here, and, and I hope to take you through a little bit of our vision of the way the world is going. And, and the first thing I want to start out with is what are APIs? And, and I truly believe these are the products of the 21st century. And the products of the 18th, 19th, and earlier 20th century, I mean, what we used to have was like just homemade stuff, right? This beautiful homemade chocolate. And then, and then last century, we, we productized those things. Uh, and so here's a lovely chocolate factory spurning out perfectly identical pieces of chocolate. And the thing about products are that they're reproducible. They're reliable. And, and this concept of fungible, what does fungible mean? It means you can replace one with another. So you can replace one box of, of Mars bars with another box of Mars bars because they're identical and, and reliable. And I, I want to go even further back in history and, and look at the Phoenicians. So these guys, this is an ancient carving, a 3,000-year-old carving of these guys with their big beards who used to, to row around the, the Mediterranean. And what they did was they introduced intermediaries and trade. So what the Phoenicians did was they would pick up, you know, carpets from Cyrene and take them round and drop them off in Sicily and get olives from Sicily and drop them round in Sardinia and get lemons from Sardinia. And so what has this got to do with APIs? Well, today, most APIs are direct from the producer to the consumer. So in other words, we are you know, if, if you use Transport for London's APIs or StubHub's APIs or, or Bank of New York Mellon's APIs, you are talking directly to them. But that is changing. We're seeing a, a sort of change, a bit like when the Phoenicians started trading around Europe, where we're beginning to see a bifurcation, an intermediation of APIs. And we're beginning to see APIs become much more like real products in the real world, where they can be traded, resold, and can create this, this economy of APIs. So this is an example we helped build in Sri Lanka, which is called IdeaBiz. And IdeaBiz is an API store and app store where not just the one company puts APIs into IdeaBiz, but lots of different companies can create their own APIs and host them in the API store, and most importantly, generate revenue from them. And this onboarded 2,500 developers in 18 months who created 3,500 apps. So this ability to share in the revenue through what's called an API marketplace created a, a, an upsurge of development and applications and revenue sharing. So that was really cool. Here's an even more interesting scenario. So this is a company called Appagate. And Appagate runs a hub in, in, in the Far East, in Singapore. And their hub takes APIs from multiple parties and bundles them and resells them to cell operators like Cellcom. In, in the, throughout the region, in Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and so forth. And this is a revenue sharing operate, op situation as well. So the, the cell operator pays for the bundle, and the hub operator gets a share of the revenue, and then they pass back revenue to the creators of the original APIs. But what's interesting is that Orange runs a similar hub in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. And they want to resell those bundles. So they buy the bundle from Appagate, and they resell it to their cell operators. And now it's a three-way revenue share. So now they take some revenue, they take some revenue, and then most of it gets passed back here. So you can see what I mean, that we are creating these opportunities where the products become resellable and this can create new business models that didn't exist before. The Bank of New York Mellon is an asset management bank. So what that means is they look after shares, options, derivatives, 
uh, commodities on behalf of around 3,000 other institutions, insurance companies, other banks, financial institutions. And they manage $33 trillion of assets on behalf of those other companies. And they do it through a system called Nexend. What they used to have was hundreds of different ways that those companies could manage their assets, talk to them, through FTP, through file, through SOAP interfaces, through all sorts of different systems. And they unified it all in a single portal called Nexend. And of course, yes, it's built on WSO2 technology. But what's really interesting is that they are starting to allow their customers and partners to add APIs into Nexend. So Nexend is no longer just full of Bank of New York Mellon APIs. It's going to have APIs from other parties in it. And Jonathan Pearl, who spoke at our New York summit, said something really, really interesting. He said, we want to blur the lines between our technology and our customers. And what does that mean? That means creating true partnerships around products and creating the ability for their customers to become an ecosystem as well. And what does this mean for APIs? It means that we have to treat APIs as product. If they're the products of the 21st century, that means we have a responsibility to learn about product management. Right? Product management is more than just put an API up and a bit of documentation. It's about marketing. It's about understanding your customer. It's about listening to your customer and taking that back. And this is a great thing. There are different roles and goals in an API manager. You have to understand your market fit. You have to be a growth hacker. So you have to be able to figure out how I can get more people to use my API. How can I be more competitive? How can I be a retention strategist? How can I sustain and maintain my market share and stop people using other APIs? So these are all skills we need. And one of our customers, Cerner, is really, really interesting because they believe that there's an API economy inside their organization. And they've spent a lot of time developing these skills of API product management inside Cerner. So they've spent a lot of work on how do we market our APIs, not just to the users, but also to the providers. What's in it for me to provide an API to other people is the first question people asked. And they did all sorts of cool growth hacking. They did all sorts of internal education. We went and did workshops with them to help people learn about APIs and the API economy and why it's valuable. Of course, we have a product that helps you. And we're very pleased we've just announced version 3 of the API Manager. And it has a whole bunch of capabilities that really help you with this. So we have an API product designer, which allows you to create a product out of a set of individual APIs, create subscription plans, and bundle it. We have improvements to the monetization. And of course, we have some cool tech as well. So we're the first API manager to directly integrate with Kubernetes as an operator and provide direct integration to Kubernetes. So we're not stopping our techie stuff too. And what about security? Of course, we have massive amounts of security in here, and, and we are leaders in, in identity management, which is a key part of this. Cuppinger Cole is the leading analyst in that space, and they've named us as a leader in API identity management. And I really put that down to Prabhuf. Some of you will know Prabhuf. He's our leader for identity and access management, and you know he's literally written the book, well, two books on this, um, and these are, these are really important books, so I, I recommend you get those and have a look. This is the new one, which is uh, being co-authored with the lead of our API management, Noam Diaz, and um, it's in an early access version, so you can read some of the chapters already. But I think APIs are important internally as well as externally. So I've given you some external examples of APIs, but I want to talk about how APIs work internally and why I think the API economy 
is important inside large organizations as well as across organizations. And we all know the integration imperative is growing, right? And what we're seeing is this inexorable decomposition into smaller and smaller components. And we see this over, over like 20, 30, 40 years. So my first job was working for IBM building a system that worked on a PC and talked directly to a mainframe. And this was before the word client server was invented. We called it cooperative computing. And that was the one of those first things where we broke apart a monolithic business app and put it on, uh, on a distributed system. That has happened more and more. So why, why is this happening? The first is that it, you can be more agile. When you have these smaller components, you can recompose them. The second is you can scale them faster and better. So Kubernetes helps you scale stuff faster than using virtual machines, which helps you scale stuff faster than using bare metal. So all of these moves are about helping us scale and be more agile. And of course, you save a lot of cost if you pack a lot of containers into uh, Kubernetes rather than using a VM. I have this argument with my wife every summer. So we're packing up to go on holiday, right? And I'm the one who puts it all in the car. And she brings out these great big bags stuffed. And I'm like, take them and I repack them in smaller bags because you can squeeze them into the car better when they're small shapes, right? When you bring out this monster thing and you put one of them, two of them in, and then suddenly you can't put anything more in. So, so, you know, we have this fight. So I'm, I'm all for decomposing into smaller components. And Randy Hefner at Forrester says this really interesting thing, which is that we have an unknown future of constant change. Right? That's the only thing we can be sure about is the world's going to change. We're going to need to adapt. And APIs are what allow you to reconfigure that. They're the glue between these services. So what that means is in the future, every developer is an integration developer. So every generalization is wrong, OK? <laughs> Including this one. <laughs> but seriously, you know, of course, of course, there will always be exceptions. But the reality is, I mean, what was the last stronghold of developers who just built stuff that didn't go anywhere else? That was embedded development, right? And 10 years ago, embedded developers just wrote stuff on a microprocessor that lived on a bit of hardware. And now they're all IoT programmers, and they're all doing, you know, connecting everything up with MQTT and co-op and everything. So there is no, there's no place left where we're not coding and consuming APIs. And that's why we wrote Ballerina. So Ballerina is the first programming language built around APIs. Every other programming language starts out with the idea we're building stuff in memory, we're building stuff in process, we're building a single thing, and everything else is just I.O., right? There's disk, there's, there's console, there's keyboard, and there's network, and those are I.O., those are something else, right? We built a, a language that started with the concept that we're building network-connected apps and built things like the type system, APIs, endpoints, listeners, services as first-class entities. And we built it around this idea of a sequence diagram. So when we start and do a project with somebody to integrate something, we always start with drawing a sequence diagram. So the language draws the sequence diagram for you. And, it, and, and so it's self-documenting. But it's also got this basis of this is what we expect to happen. We expect to be connecting across the internet. We expect to be connecting to services, and we expect failure. When you build network services, you have to expect failure because they go down. <clears throat> we just had an exciting moment. We launched 1.0 of Ballerina. We had a big celebration. We had beautiful Ballerina-themed cupcakes. And, and more importantly, we, we put it up on the web 1.0. We're currently, yesterday, we launched 1.0.3. We're doing little patch releases every two weeks. So in the, two, in the month and a half since then, we've done three patch releases, and we're going to carry on that. 
And as well as, <clears throat> as well as shipping this as a pure language, we have a product, right? You know, we're a product company. So, so we are selling this to our customers. You can get this as a supported part of our enterprise integrator. So we are offering you Ballerina, Synapse, and Cidi as three ways of building integration. Real-time integration, config, traditional ESB drag and drop integration, and code-driven integration. Now, if you ask me what should I use for my next project, this is where I would go. Because this is our belief that this is the best way of doing it. But of course, you know, we have to help our customers. You know, we don't just say to you, do this, right? We give you advice, but sometimes you have other good reasons to want to do it using a traditional ESB model, or you want to take your traditional ESB and migrate it to a cloud-native containerized environment, which is what EI7 lets you do. And of course, real-time and streaming is a huge part of the world. Whoa. And the introduction of Cidi as part of EI, I think, is really important. Because this allows you to build high-performance real-time streaming applications in a very, very cloud-native, simple, effective way, working with Kafka and with NATS, as well as other systems. So I'm way over time, so I'm going to have to speed up. So I want to talk to you about why I think the API economy is important inside an organization. And the Agile Manifesto says that the best architectures, requirements, and designs come from self-organizing teams. Right? So we need to be team-based. And we know from Jeff Bezos right, that a team should be a two-pizza team. Right now, I, this doesn't really work in England, does it? So, so two pizzas means two people here. <laughs> That's me and Javier, right? <laughs> That's a two pizza team. But you know what I mean. Like between five and ten people is the right size for a team. Maybe twelve. And there's a lot of maths for this. A lot of science behind why this is right. So if you have a ten-person team, there are forty-five connections between those ten people. If you add one more person, 11 people, it becomes 90 connections, right? That's crazy, isn't it? And uh, Jennifer Muller at Wharton Business School did a study and interviewed a whole bunch, 212 knowledge workers, and found that as team sizes grew, productivity shrank, and people were more stressed, less effective at their jobs. And the real key point here is something called relational loss. And that's because there's just too many people to know. Our brains, there's a whole bunch of science about how many people our brains can keep track of. And at the maximum is about 150. So we were kind of designed to, to be in small groups, you know, a village basically. And, and to know like 10 or 12 people really well and 150 people okay-ish. And so that's what our brains cope with. So all of this drives this thing, which is Conway's Law, which he, he came up with back in 1967. Which basically says that the code you build, the structures, the technical stuff you build, is based on the teams, not the other way around. I think it was better put by Eric Raymond. If you have four groups working on a compiler, you get a four-pass compiler, right? And, and so I, I used to, I mean, I heard about this back when I was doing that, that summer working for IBM in, in 1987. And I was like, oh, stupid managers. You know, that's just their fault, isn't it? And then, now I'm a manager, so now I can't blame the managers anymore. So I, I've changed my view. And my view is that, you know, you can't, you can't fight human nature, you can't fight culture. You can't fight the, the, the underlying psychology and, and brain chemistry of this. You, 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 have to, you have to adapt to this. You have to think. So you have to think, well, okay, is it easier to change human nature or write code? 
right? It's easy to write code. So we need to write code that helps us deal with this rather than expect that, that we're going to change human nature and build systems that are going to work despite our team organization. And, and the proof of this is here. So agile, so, so 98% of companies are doing some agile, right? And 60% of them are doing a lot of agile and say, well, I'm still getting there, but I'm doing a lot of agile. And only 4% say that they see the effects of agile in being more, more competitive, more adaptable to the market. So 96% of, of, of people interviewed didn't feel that the agility was really working at the customer front end. And whose fault is that? It's my fault. I'm sorry. I, I, I take full responsibility for this. It's to do with the integration, I believe. It's because when you come to the market, you have to work across teams. You have to work across parts of your organization. You have to integrate the customer domain with the processing domain, with the order domain, with, with, the, you know, with the back end. You have to pull together these agile teams. And it's the integration where we fall apart. <clears throat> and it's because we built these centers of excellence. And every time you have a center of excellence, you end up adding a waterfall step into your agile project. And one of our customers is Jaguar Land Rover, and the, the CIO there calls it Wagile, waterfall agile. I was talking to another customer, and he says, yeah, we call it Fagile, fake agile, right? And these are the challenges. This is why we're not seeing it at the customer front end. This guy from 451 Group says, you know, you say center of excellence, I hear silo. So what do we do to, to fix that? Well, what, what people like Uber and people have done is to say, well, okay, we're going to go to a microservices architecture. Everyone's going to be independent. And three years ago, Uber said they had several hundred microservices. This is what they said they had this year. This is their microservice graph. Now, I have no idea the, the underlying technology behind this. I saw the presentation, but they didn't go into too much detail. But if I was the CIO or CTO of Uber, and I looked at this, do you think I'd be excited or scared? Now, what's scary here is it, it's not the number of dots, right? The dots is okay. We can manage thousands of microservices. What's scary is the lines, right? It's the fact that if I own this microservice, I have hundreds of different people calling me, and I need to manage that. I need to govern that. I need to know who's calling me, how they're calling me. I need to be a product manager, right? I need, and and I, I, personally, I think you need some structure here. So I think that self-organizing teams need boundaries. And I, I love biology. I, I used to hate biology, but I've grown to love biology. I used to think it was too complex. And now I realize everything's complex, and, and you need analogies from the complex world, not from the simple world. You know, maths. We used to think of computing in terms of maths, in terms of set theory. And that puts everything into neat little boxes, and then you find actually the neat little boxes don't work very useful. Well. So in biology, we have these things. These are cells, right? And cells have, what do you see when you look at the picture of cells? You see the boundaries. You see the, the, the edges. This is what stops us just being a pile of goo on the floor, right? And, <clears throat> and the cell is the basic structural unit of, of every part of biology, of flora and fauna. And the boundaries of cells are called membranes. And they have these things called transmembrane receptors. So what happens is, an enzyme or a, um, a, a, a protein comes along, drifts along, and it binds to a receptor on the outside. And that causes a signal to go through the boundary and causes another protein or enzyme to be released or to act inside the cell. And I look at this, and what do I see? I see an API micro gateway and an event-driven architecture. 
right? So here are the events passing on the outside, and some of them are allowed through by the gateway, and some of them are, are not, right? And, and this is what we need. We need cell boundaries, and, and the API micro gateway is a way of creating these cell boundaries between teams and, and in putting order into that microservices mess. And so, you know, in, in domain-driven design, we had this thing called a bounded context, right? This came back in the 90s in, in OO programming. And Asanka, who's going to talk shortly about this more, uh, and I came up with this idea of a cell-based architecture about two years ago. And this is a, a, a paper that we put into GitHub. We have pull requests. You can take a read of it. And if you don't think it's right or you think you can improve it, we, we love your, your input. And, and we think that cells are the building blocks of a composable enterprise. So you need to build these self-contained, domain-bounded concepts of cells that then can put some structure into that picture that Uber has. So that picture of Uber is like the goo on the floor, isn't it? It's like just a mass of stuff. We need some higher level structures in there. And that's what this cell-based architecture is. And what's this got to do with APIs and products? I think you need to treat the interface of that cell as a product. And that's really what we've been doing with a project called Celery. So we started building this, uh, this architecture, and people said, well, that's fine, Paul. But how do I implement that? And so Celery is a project that helps you do this on top of Kubernetes. It helps you create cells, manage cells, deploy cells, run cells, and monitor cells. And just like Ballerina, you start with some simple code, and you get a graphical view of what you're doing. And we also just released a, a version of this uh, point four about a month ago. So where does that take us? I think where it takes us is that we, we need to move the organization along as well as the technology. We need to have a technology and a, and a model that's in sync with humans, with teams, with, with our concepts, but we also need a, a, a view of the, the overall progression. How can we make ourselves more digitally aligned? And that's where this paper from Asanka comes in. This is really, really cool. He's basically mapped out the journey that different organizations take as they try to become more digitally aligned. And he's mapped it out in terms of people, process, and technology. So in other words, it's fine just say, oh, we, you know, the CI says I need to be more digital. I need to be more aligned. Someone's got to go and fix that. And, and there's this thing called a messy middle. Right, which is what happens when you start trying to be digitally transformed. You know, there's this sort of big mess between where we are now and where we want to be. And this is a roadmap of how to get through that messy middle. So I take a, I recommend you look at this as well, please. So I just want to finish on this idea. So, so I, I know I went over, but I, I hope you, you got something out of this, which is that I think we need a, an architecture that's not just a technical architecture, it fits with the human, the organizational, the process model. It fits with teams. It fits with effective teams. And it's based around products. And that's what will really create a composable enterprise that can take you into the next century with your digital initiatives. Thank you.